I'll try not to walk in front of that. Okay, hey, my name is uh, Rear Admiral David Gordo. I'm a retired Navy expeditionary guy. We call them dirt sailors. Uh, I was in command of Navy Expeditionary Combat Command in my final tour. It's about 20,000 sailors around the world. It does uh, maritime expeditionary security, so that's why I'm here. Uh, Explosive ordnance disposal, Navy divers, Navy CBs, and some intelligence guys. Uh, you know, I'm here today representing Ocean Power Technologies, but most importantly, I'm here to talk to you about uh, about persistent intelligence and why that's so important in this in this maritime domain. And I think we got a little bit of there from Mike on that same topic. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to ask you some questions, and I don't really care if you answer them or not because I'm actually just going to talk because it would throw you off if you actually answer them. So I'll ask you if you guys agree on everything you want, and then I'll agree you and just say whatever. I'm going to say. Um, but, and, and I'm gonna, you know, that way we can talk a little bit about why persistence, surveillance, and unmanned technologies are so important today. And, and I'm gonna go a little bit around, around that way, so hopefully I'll keep y'all engaged, engaged while I'm doing that. Um, Master Chief, if I don't, make sure that you keep everybody awake. You can see those guns there, I think you probably can take care of them. Uh, okay, so, so let, me, let me ask you a question. What makes an expert, do you think? Corky, Corky, what makes an expert? Exactly, exactly what I was saying. What makes an expert is education, right? Probably some training. I think most importantly, experience. 10,000 hours. Right, 10,000 hours, very good, exactly. See, so he said it, and he went right along with what I was saying. It's like when, when the Germans bought Pearl Harbor, I won a ball, right? So, uh, so, I think experience, 10,000 hours, that time in the seat, understanding your environment really well, to the point where an expert can usually see what's coming, many times see what's coming and get ahead of it, or see what's coming and maybe uh, uh, maybe figure out how to mitigate it. That's real expertise. That usually takes you know, 10,000 hours, 20 to 25 years in a, in, in, a, in a job, understanding what's around you, understanding your capabilities and the capabilities of others. I think uh, in, in probably too many words is what makes it extra. But, but you know, that's, that expertise and that ability to be a little bit prescient and foresee the future is actually based in neuroscience. Uh, I am not a, 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 a scientist. I was a budding historian at Naval Academy, so I mostly reach back to uh, things that I've been taught by others, so that's what I'm doing here. But, but uh, our limbic systems, uh, when we were, you know, kind of cavemen, uh, were used to keep us alive, right? Uh, and, and with our limbic system, we had this ability to sense what was going on in our environment, even if it wasn't overt. And uh, and that would trigger either cortisol, the cortisol dump, and you know, like how you feel when you know something bad's coming, which I've had happen most of my career. You know something bad's coming, and you get get kind of sick to your stomach, that's, cort that's cortisol, that's your limbic system. Uh, reacting, phys you know, uh, physically, phys physiologically to that, that response from your brain. Or if something good's gonna happen, you get that dopamine dump, you know, and it feels really good, that's your limbic system reacting to something that you've identified in your environment that, uh, that is, is making you happy or is gonna make you happy. And actually, men, have about six channels of information that they can take in kind of subconsciously at any one time. Women have double that, but for a little more, 13 channels, at least from the, from the data that I've read or the research that I've read. And it, that, that really says a little something about maybe what we call intuition, women's intuition for years, is that it, they have the ability to take in more of these signals from their environment because they understand their environment and they, they then can that, that then gets uh, uh, translated into a reaction by your limbic system, which gives you these hormone dumps. And with the dopamine, you get enough of the dopamine dump, uh, and eventually that turns into serotonin, the snow hormone, and you become uh, and you become emotionally attached to that response. So this is all based in neuroscience. What we found during Iraq and Afghanistan is we can use that to our advantage. Uh, it, it's kind of like. Um, teaching intuition, if you will. Helping folks get a little bit closer to that expertise 
that they will need in order to see, understand, and react to their environment in the most appropriate ways. So in our academic past and kind of the tactical level, we found that when we were out moving around uh, off of a fob or, or out of a safe house, uh, we got to the point where we understood our environment so well that when something was different, it would trigger a cortisol dump and we just know. This doesn't seem right. And it may be as simple as there was, uh, there was some garbage in a pile in a place where we hadn't seen it that was called ground sign awareness. And, and, but a lot of times that would be triggered subconsciously more than consciously, and then you'd have to identify what exactly that hazard, that threat was. And then what we found was this correlation between that feeling, because we knew our environment, and ambushes and IEDs. And how many remaining Marines, former Marines out there? So Combat Hunter was based on that course that is taught by the Marine Corps now, was based on this science that we found in Iraq and Afghanistan in, in, the, in the early 2000s. That's really about understanding the pattern of life, identifying those anomalies, even if subconsciously reacting to those anomalies, responding and investigating what that anomaly is, and then taking the appropriate action to mitigate, much like an expert does. Right? They, they, they know intuitively, uh, and, this, and that's all based in neuro, neuroscience. It's true strategically as well. So in 2016, there was seven, seven or eight uh, uh, missile, uh, missile tests by the North Koreans. Anybody, the WMD guys upstairs. Anybody else know that there was seven or eight missile tests by the North Koreans. By correlating the data prior to the missile test. And when I say data, I'm talking data lakes. All, all types of uh, pattern of life. Economic pattern of life, traffic pattern of life, uh, 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 social media pattern of life. By, by, looking at, by looking at all that data, studying and correlating and analyzing it, we found that someone in the North Korean regime who, would, who knew when the test would be were shorting coal stocks and making money because they knew the sanctions would come right after these tests. And by understanding the pattern of life, we were then in 2017 able to predict at least a couple of these missile, uh, missile tests. That's, how, that's how, how strong this idea of understanding, and Mike talked about it in his last talk, in his last uh, uh, brief, you know, understanding that pattern of life, of life, identifying anomalies in that pattern of life, in that strategic way, it's identifying those anomalies, identifying where there's a military provocation to those anomalies, responding to that when you go ahead of time, and then and then mitigating the risk from that anomaly. So there's tactical and there's strategic ways to ways to. To, to mitigate and to use the pattern of life idea and the neuroscience, really the neuroscience behind it, to our advantage. Uh, let me ask you another question. So, how many folks are in charge of ports or harbors? Everybody laughs who's in charge of ports. That doesn't say much about my draw or crowd. Um, all right. So, how many? So, let's say there is people here that are right. <laughs> I, the question that I would ask is, it's really true of anything, and you're, you're a local officer, obviously, right? Rick, I think the question really is, if you had all the money, all the assets, and could do, could protect somewhere, whether it's a port or not, 100%, with 100% surety that, that nothing would happen or that you could stop it from happening, what would that look like? Right? It, would, it might look like total coverage with a whole bunch of those experts like Master Chief, you know, a whole bunch of senior enlisted or, or really experienced folks who understand that the pattern in that area, that may have been there a lot, they can identify anomalies, that a whole bunch of those, right? Standing almost hip to hip across the whole geographic area that you're looking at. That would be a win, right? Now, we all know that that's not, that's not possible. We recognize that there's an unsolvable math problem that happens within the Beltway, especially on Capitol Hill. It doesn't give us all the funding we would like to have. 
we understand that there's not enough really good uh, uh, people that have had the training and education and that long experience that they need to be that good. We understand that, uh, that, that there is not enough time to give individuals the kind of exposure that they need to get to that point. So if we're gonna bridge the gap between what we know we have available to us now and what we think would be the perfect solution for something like the perfect solution. And, and, and we want to utilize that pattern of life kind of thought process on how we can get ahead of threats before they happen. How would we do that? What would that look like? Bam! It would look like that right there. It's only sliding that. Right on this side. It would look just like that. And what I mean by that is the bridge between where we are and where we'd ideally be is technology. Now hold on, before everybody gets all fired up, before you, where's Eric? Eric's getting fired up right now. Ah, there he is. All right, before you get all fired up, Eric, I know that technology will not replace the human being. I think there are tasks that technology can accomplish, but it will always take the expert to ensure that they are interpreted, that whatever that task is, is interpreted and carried out in the right way. That's my uh, I'm not too worried about trying to take it over and uh, our work that are coming in. But I would say that technology is absolutely in an 100% of the time, utilizing technology can make things easier for the operator to execute their mission, especially in the, from the perspective of a pattern of life. Because the macro system that, that you have to understand, it's so large, that one individual or even many individuals will have a hard time collating, integrating, and analyzing that data. But technology, like AI, can do it. The macro system that requires sensing at the front edge in that whatever geographic area you are, whether it's in your patch serve, or whether it's in a port somewhere, or whether it's in an AOR, sensing in that way requires technology to be able to have the capacity and the persistence that we need to feed the data back to be analyzed and understand that data. And it looks something like that. Now it may not be an OPT movie with sensors on it, as you see there, or a WAMP, B, but it, it could be really any number of sensors on the front edge. But the key to that is they are persistent, right? They're in that environment all the time, like our experts would be. They are looking at all of the things around them, above the sea, below the sea, and on the, and on the surface, so in all domains. They are capturing that data and then pushing that data back so that it can be analyzed by things like AI. And once that AI has its computer version of dopamine or, uh, or, or cortisol, that, that, that limbic response, Whatever that looks like within the circuits of this computer, and I think based on Mike's last brief, he could probably tell you that I certainly can't, but that looks like a, uh, a flag that tells us that there's an anomaly in the pattern of life that those sensors told us about, that our AI analyzed, that provided us with the knowledge to know that anomaly needs to be investigated. Then we said, in this piece of way of put it out because that's our mobile platform to investigate that anomaly. Once we investigate the anomaly, we can make a decision on whether that anomaly needs to be taken care of, mitigated, or uh, impacted in some way. And once we make that decision, or once we decide we need to do something, we can make the right decision and whether that be send out a manned vessel or utilize some other te uh, technology to execute that operation. We now have those tools in our toolbox, which gives us a full kill chain from the beginning of sensing to the end of strike, that we're able to uh, uh, achieve the impact of the environment that we want to have. So, so if we're to draw this line all the way from a human being that's an expert at what they do to where we can actually get uh, today with the money, the resources, the people that we have, that line goes through uh, and really carries along with it the, the, the expert to technology 
to application of technology in an AOR, to understanding of pattern of life, to investigation and action. And, action. Uh, and so what I would like to leave you with is, is any, any, problem can, any problem can be solved with that type of framework. That's probably an overstatement. I would say any operational problem as, we, as we've discussed here at Maritime Security, if looked at through the framework that I just described, will allow you to uh, have a decision cycle that gets you in front of those uh, in front of those problems to solve them or mitigate them rather than react. Okay. Short and sweet, 415, some of your questions. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.